Hello everyone, welcome to Namala Excellence Bangalore. In this video, today's session, we are going to discuss about the recently happened UPSC mains examination GS paper 1 question paper analysis. So, as part of this video, we will be trying to analyze the first what are the questions came, from which subject how many questions came and we will try to do some analysis before and then we will enter into the discussion part directly. We will try to solve all the 20 questions and we will try to generate some brainstorming ideas how we can solve the paper. If you see this year there has been a change which happened in the nature of questions which has been asked in UPSC mains exam. We will try to analyze all these things very clearly in this one video which we wanted to dedicate only for GS paper 1. So, if you see the total number of questions which has been asked in this year UPSC mains exam, from this uh, uh, analysis it is very clear from this pi diagram, majority of the questions dominated from only two areas that is out of 20 questions more than 50 percent of the questions came from world geography, one is on world geography, second is on society. So, you should give maximum attention to these areas while preparing for the GS paper 1 because this is the trend UPSC has been following over the last 5 to 10 years and they have gone with the same pattern this year also. That is they have maintained the majority of the questions from two areas only that is geography and society. But if you specifically see what is the total number of questions which they asked. Yes. So, if you see here this table it will be even much more clear about the total number of questions which has been asked this year that is as I said before maximum number of questions that is out of the 20 questions more than that is nearly 50 percent of the questions came from geography segment that is world geography. So, students while preparing for GS paper 1 they should make sure that they do not miss the geography first. Second when you study the geography make sure you are very good with conceptual clarity not just reading the school books and superficially doing the road memory kindly do not do that. If you lack basic understanding in geography, kindly make sure your conceptual clarity is good because this year UPSC has dedicatedly they have allotted questions interlinking the concept by applying this question in the exam hall. We will try to see that not only in case of geography and even this year UPSC has also asked almost like 7, per 7 questions out of 20 questions from society segment also. So, you have to make sure that when you prepare for this subject, you have to give maximum attention to world geography followed by world history, then you can allot for the other areas. This year what is the missing segment in the UPSC mains exam is they have totally neglected the world history segment. So, in the world history they have not asked any direct questions because even in the last 5 to 7 years trend analysis if you observe also UPSC will maximum ask one question or two questions only from the world history segment and this year they have stopped that pattern also they have not even asked a single question on world history. So, while preparing for world history make sure you have some rough understanding about the effects of first world war, second world war and what are the changes in policies after the war. So, make sure you understand this along with the basics of industrial revolution, American revolution, Russian revolution all those things which will be covering as part of the syllabus. Now, going into the remaining component, you should also give maximum focus on modern history about the various types of basic freedom struggle movement and even while studying the freedom struggle movement, in the syllabus only they have clearly mentioned they will give maximum attention to the personalities who are mentioned in the freedom struggle and even if you see this year, UPSC has asked in modern history segment questions basically on especially on this freedom struggle personalities only and even on the art and culture segment art and culture segment this year the number of questions has been less but if you see the UPSC trend analysis they generally tend to ask minimum three questions from art and culture segment and even this year there has been not a change in actually overall pattern of questions which are asked in the UPSC mains exam. So, they have not changed the pattern but they have changed the nature of questions which are asked in the UPSC mains exam to make things clear. Let us travel into the 20 questions because uh, this year if you see UPSC overall changed the nature of questions from asking a lengthy paragraph based questions or statement based questions to a directly uh, sentence which questions are now simplified to just one or two sentence and these sentences can be interpreted multiply. That is what the challenge in this year mains examination. We will try to solve that also now one by one. Yes. 
Yes. <coughs> so let's now go into the questions. Uh, one by one, we will try to read the questions and let's try to generate some what is the requirement of the question and what are the basic contents you can brainstorm even with less knowledge or if you have a very good knowledge, how, how much level you can improve for the content or answer which you are presenting in the answer. These are some things which we, you will be getting benefit out of this video. But our discussion will majorly focus on how you brainstorm the content and the, how you effectively address the content. Because these are the things which are still challenging in UPSC mains answer writing. It is not that just you go on road learn whatever concepts we have studied and try to memorize that and vomit that in the exam all that is not the requirement of this exam because even this year UPSC has made very sure that what they wanted to ask in the question they have actually made it bit more uh, like the nature of the questions has been changed we will try to do that and explain all those things which we are discussing step by step so let's now go into the first question that is they have asked about explain the role of geographical factors towards the development of ancient India. See, first of all, the one biggest challenge in this question is you need to identify which component of the syllabus in GS paper 1 this particular question has been picked up because this year this is going to be very much challenging for the students inside the mains exam hall because if you look at the question, this question is picked from both geography and history. It is a combination of geography question plus history question. This is the new trend which has emerged in UPSC mains examination. Starting from this year, till now, geography question means they will ask only direct geography question or society means only society questions. But this is the first year in UPC mains examination, they started interlinking the subjects with various subjects. For example, geography has been mixed with history. So, if this, this question is the best example uh, to tell what we wanted to say. That is, explain the role of geographical factors towards the development of ancient India. So, here students should understand very well what is the requirement of the question. So, after understanding the requirement of the question, let us try to brainstorm some basic ideas what you can write so that you make sure that you do not deviate from the content which is asked in the exam hall. This is one thing you have to be very careful always when you write a means answer writing in UPC exam. Now, let us go into this concept. So, here the requirement of the question is very clear. They are asking you the role of geographical factors which are actually leading to the development of ancient India. Ancient India we know very well, we have studied more on that for preliminary examination and even when it goes to mains exam, we would have studied art and cultural aspect. But they are not worried about those segments which you have studied for the exam in your NCRT books or standard textbooks. Here the requirement is such that they are only bothered about what kind of geographical factors which has led to the development of ancient India. Here what you need is, you do not require any PhD to answer this kind of examination. What you require is a basic, simple, common sense which you should use inside the exam hall. What is the problem is, most of us do not use the common sense commonly inside the exam hall. Because if you understand the meaning of geographical factor, we know very well geographical factors includes mountains, plateaus, plains, rivers, coastlines, mineral resources, passes. So, all this will come under geographical factors. So, here what you should do, candidates while addressing this question, you make sure that you connect the geographical factors with respect to the development of ancient India, especially when you talk about ancient India, you need to talk about the kingdoms, you need to talk about the culture as well as the lifestyle which has been developed during the ancient India. So, for all these activities, in the question what they are telling is, geographical factors played a dominant role, whether they played a dominant role or they played a minor role or they played a uh, very minimal role that is up to you to elaborate on the question. But make sure that you relate this component of the question with the requirement of the question asked. Because once you relate it, you know very well, see for writing these kind of questions, I, we always encourage our students who are writing this kind of mains exam, even when you write a art and culture or history segment, make sure you come up with an innovative or creative diagrams for your answer. For example, what you can do is, you can run India map and make sure you say that, see, uh, during the historical time period, we had various passes which are located along the northwestern part of India, starting from Khyber Pass, Khyber Pass and then you can also talk about Bolan Pass, 
So all these passes, they actually make sure that we have an active connection with the regions in the Central Asian countries as well as even we faced a lot of kingdoms which are conquering India. They also assessed India because of the weakness we had in this narrow passes. So you have, it had both geographical advantage as well as disadvantage. But due to the influx of foreign countries, foreign invasions in India, the culture as well as the kingdom, they kept on changing and that decided the development of ancient India. So you have to link in such a manner that each geographical factor which you are talking about here, it is connected with the help of diagram with the development of ancient India. That is the decrement of the question. So this question is uh, for answering these kind of questions, you don't require any kind of elaborate, uh, what to say, complex concepts to answer this question. Make sure you understand the demand of the question. After understanding the demand of the question, make sure that you try to address the question. Because we have been keep telling the students over the years, it's not just keeping writing the uh, like uh, writing the answer in a required format. That is a structure followed by introduction, body conclusion. That is not the only criteria examiner will look for in your answer. Examiner will also look for very qualitative answer. And the first first thing before the quality comes is whether you are actually understanding the question. See, many students will be uh, talking about uh, development of ancient India without linking the geographical factors. If you do that. The examiner will not even give you one mark also for this question. So what candidate should avoid in this question? You should avoid writing something which is deviating from the requirement of the question. What you should stay in the requirement of the question? Stay in the requirement of various plateaus, coastal lines. So coastal lines, how you can link it with the ancient India is, it, during ancient Indian time period, India was able to, with the help of coast, it was able to trade with various countries in Central Asia, Southeast Asian countries like Thailand, Malaysia and even West Asian countries, India was able to trade in a better manner, in a successful manner, mainly because of the long coastal line it had. So you need to link with this and these enabled the kingdoms to survive because of the development of better trade connectivity as well as we make sure that India was able to export its goods to other countries in the past. This we have been doing. So all this led to the economic resources, we have development of economic resources during the ancient India. So you need, need to make sure that you talk about all these things in an orderly fashion. So that's the requirement of the question. The question here is very simple provided if you don't deviate from the requirement of the question. So I hope you can answer this question. And while answering the question, make sure that you have a proper introduction, body, conclusion. And while writing the introduction, make sure that you write it in a two to three lines on an average. And even while writing the conclusion, it should be written in two to three lines. But when you are representing the main theme of the answer or the body of the answer, make sure you attack the question directly and try to contribute. If it is a 10 marker, you should try to contribute at least 7 to 10 points with examples and diagrams. That itself is enough to fetch maximum marks in the examination. Is it fine? So I hope you would have understood the first question. Let's now move to the second question. But before that, make sure that while uh, giving conclusion, before, before concluding this question, make sure that you talk about what is the role. That is, what they are asking here is explain the role of geographical factors. So make sure that while explaining the question, whether that role is a positive role, negative role, whether that role is a maximal role or minimal role, whether that role is a active role, dormant role or extinct role. So your answer should necessarily contain, uh, contain this at the before the conclusion or at the conclusion you should say that Thus, from the above discussion, we can we can conclude that geographical factors predominantly played an active role in the development of ancient India. If you are saying that you have a lot of examples where you linked the geographical factors with the development of ancient India. Suppose, if you feel that there is a no proper linkage, make sure that the role of geographical factors during the ancient time period was very minimal. You can say you have the liberty to do that. But make sure you are connecting with the demand of the question. Since here the question is all about, you need to explain the role of geographical factor. Make sure after explaining it, you can also have the liberty to talk about the kind of role which has been contributed by geographical factor. If you do that, you are actually going to impress the examiner. Fine. Now let's go into the second question.
fine now the second question is all about what was the difference between mahatma gandhi ji and rabindranath tagore in their approach towards education and nationalism see if you see here friends again this question has been asked directly from your modern indian segment <coughs> from your modern indian history segment this question has been asked so first thing what you need to understand is in any gs paper which you are writing in the mains examination you need to point out after reading the question this question is picked from which part of the syllabus component once you understand that then you are almost like 25% you are ready to answer the question so make sure that you understand where the syllabus is in which part of the syllabus component the question is picked from so your job is 25% then after understanding that now let's try to understand and read the question even better manner here what they are asking is they are actually asking the major difference between mahatma gandhi ji and rabindranath tagore on two areas they are asking one is on education sector second is on nationalism so how they differ in their perspectives so from the question only it's very clear there is a difference in approach that's why they have asked this question so by using common sense what you should do is you make sure you don't write the similarities in their approaches when you write there is a difference in approach that's why they have asked this question with this common sense approach let's now try to approach this question so while addressing the question we always keep telling the students make sure that you segregate your answer into various components such that you always come up with an introduction in two to three lines and while writing the body of the answer it should always be represented in a point wise format with a proper subheading approach followed by a conclusion again which is in two to three lines so if you could do this properly inside the exam all you are going to get at least for a 10 marker five marks easily in the exam and followed by it if you have a very good uniqueness in your answer and if you have a very good uh, knowledge about understanding and addressing the question we are going to fetch that extra one mark so that's what we need to do now let's stay to the demand of the question so they are asking about two things here they are actually bothered about education sector so we need to talk about education sector as well as nationalism so here while talking about it you need to talk about what is the opinion of rabindranath tagore and you need to talk about what is the view point of mahatma gandhi so if you have this clarity and this kind of presentation or approach in your answer it means that you are actually directly attacking the question from the uh, starting point this you should convey to the examiner very clearly whenever they ask you a difference make sure you write it in a tabular column format don't write it in a point wise format because see when you draw a tabular column and you when you write a points in this manner it conveys to the examiner that you have a very good approach because what you are writing here you are going to write the opposite here and you will also stay tuned to the demand of the question but if you don't understand the demand of the question when you write in the point wise format the examiner will also feel very tough to identify what is the exact difference you have written so make sure you go with this kind of approach only and here while talking about education both rabindranath tagore and gandhi ji had a difference in approach for example uh, rabindranath tagore when he talked about education what he said is that education is one we should focus us on holistic education that is he talked about a concept of holistic education that is education is something which should bring in creativity among the people that is the purpose of education he say and in addition to that what he says is that education should also be uh, inculcated in a manner which is having a complete orientation that is individual should have proper knowledge proper emotional intellectual and all kind of abilities should be developed when he is taking the education that was the approach which was given by rabindranath tagore if you would have studied uh, in case of history while talking about personalities this kind of approaches were given so you can include those approaches that is why if you see in ncert they have mentioned that rabindranath tagore in case of west bengal kolkata he established a concept called as shanti niketan shanti niketan for in case of education what he did is he encouraged a concept of open air schools what do you mean by open air schools is that schools should function in open uh, under the trees are in nature in synchrony with uh, environment 
especially near parks or under the trees, the school environment should be created. So, students should feel connected with the environment when they study and that should be a social harmony uh, between the students as well as the environment. This was a basic emphasis given by Rabindranath Tagore in his approach of education. But when it comes to Mahatma Gandhiji, he said that education should be approached at the grassroots level. That was his first point. And second, he also talked about something called as skill education. Because education is one something it should provide skill to the people. So, with the help of these skills, you should be able to empower. That is, you should get employment. So, that is the purpose of education. And here, education should be started. And uh, basic purpose of education should also focus on basic education. That is, providing skill education. That is also one area where Gandhiji focused. So, vocational skill and training should be provided as per Gandhiji's approach so that people who get this vocational skill and training, they should be employable. So, this was the approach, how they differ between Rabindranath Tagore and Mahatma Gandhiji. So, while talking about this, make sure you split the points into multiple points, followed by each point should be given examples from various moments inside the freedom struggle. If you do that, then you are going to impress the examiner. Now, coming to the nationalism aspect. Here also, again, Rabindranath Tagore and Mahatma Gandhiji had a difference of approach in their nationalism because uh, Gandhiji wanted nationalism should be developed where nationalism first should be targeted among the grassroots level, that is from the villages. So, we should, for promoting nationalism, we should promote rural areas or villages. That was the basic approach given by Mahatma Gandhiji. So, we should tar target the grassroots level village areas marginalized sections of the society first and make sure uh, the purpose of freedom or awareness of freedom reaches these kinds of people and later when these people get aware, the freedom struggle will be a mass movement. That was the approach given by Mahatma Gandhiji. But when it comes to Rabindranath Tagore, what he says is that nationalism uh, is something which is considered to be an antithetical, that he considered it as a negative concept because what he feels is that humanitarian value is very important humanitarian value and the principles of universal brotherhood, these are very important than the concept of nationalism. So, this was given by Rabindranath Tagore. So, they have a very good difference in their approach. So, one person is against the nationalism because he feels that, Rabindranath Tagore feels that nationalism will also divide the people in the world. In the name of nation, you are dividing the people in the globe. That was the concept which was proposed by Rabindranath Tagore, where he considers that all the people in the world, they should have an unity and harmony among them. But when you talk about Mahatma Gandhiji, he is more concerned about the unity and diversity within India. So, in India, if you want a better unity uh, within the diverse population, nationalism should reach the village or rural areas or at the grassroots level and then it should be promoted. So, this is a basic approach, how they differ. Uh, between Rabindranath Tagore and Mahatma Gandhiji, once you are able to do this along with the various examples during the freedom struggle moment, then you are going to get the maximum of 5 to 6 marks which can be awarded for a 10 marker. But make sure while writing these kind of questions, you always have various examples from the national moment. Once you understand the theme of the question, the main crux in the question what needs to be written, writing the answer is going to be very simple task after that. Yes. So, now let us go to the next question. Yes, now let us go into the third question which has been asked in this year UPC mains exam. Bring out the socio-economic effects of the introduction of railways in different countries of the world. Kindly while reading the question, we always keep telling to the students over the years, whenever you read the question, kindly do not take it for granted. Kindly allot at least one minute to one and a half minutes inside the exam hall just to read and understand the question and make sure you digest the question in the proper sense. Once this is done, then half of the task is done. After that, what you require most of the situations is a simple common sense to answer the question. Even in this question, if you see this question, the maximum part of this content for the question will be available in your NCRTs only. 
even while taking NCRT economic classes, we have covered from our economics NCRTs only, a major content for this question has been, we have discussed in our classes. So, UPSC, they keep repeating their usual trend where they repeat some of the questions from the NCRT books also. And this is one best example for that. Let's now try to understand the question. So, what they are asking is, they are asking the socio-economic effects of introduction of railways in different parts of the world. So, they are basically concerned about two things. One is on social, second is on economic. So, they are actually concerned about two things. One are the social aspect, another is the economic aspect because of the introduction of railways in different countries of the world. That is across the global level. We have to make sure we give varieties of examples how these railways have led to the socio-economic development. As simple as that, this question is provided you understand it, the, it at the right sense. Because in our NCITs, majorly they have talked about uh, India only. In the case of India, how with the help of railways, Britishers were able to siphon the, uh, that is the useful resources. So, whatever cotton and then uh, cotton and uh, coal and other resources, which these uh, British people, precious stones, which they found it very useful in India, they try to siphon those resources with the help of development of railway lines in India. That is why Britishers came out with Mumbai Thane Railway in the year 1853. So, you can talk about that also, but that is not the uh, complete answer for this question because the question is very clear, you need to talk about the world. So, make sure you quote examples from varieties of countries, not just on India. If you focus only on India, that means you are not going to get maximum mark in the question and even you are not able to address the question properly. So, you should understand that. Now, going into the various economic effects. So, after the introduction of railways, there are so many positive effects which happened and even there are a lot of problems also which happened. Positively, if you see, we are able to move the people faster. So, move the people faster. Not only we are able to move the people faster, we are able to move the goods faster. So, trade improved. So, trade improved. And then uh, through railways, we were also able to, that is while referring the movement of people, we talk about two categories. One is, uh, and for the government side, we have the uh, people, that is the army people. So, why government uh, promoted, British government promoted railways in India is that, they wanted to transfer their army from one part of India to another part of India, whenever there is an instability or problem in any regions of India, that is the main reason. Second reason why Britishers developed uh, railways is also that they wanted to transfer the, especially the agricultural goods, agricultural goods are raw materials which they wanted to export and second it is also enabled the people uh, during the Britishers time if you see in case of India it was railways were able to integrate the people across various regions because Gandhiji might be sitting in Delhi or in Maharashtra while launching the freedom struggle. It is with the help of telegraphs, post and these railway lines, people across these regions, they were able to participate as well as make use of or get aware of these kind of movements which is happening in India. So, it's a, it actually, it helped in the national integration. So, you can include the national integration point here, national or social integration and even railways enabled railways enabled faster movements of that is urbanization more cities were developed across the world if you see in case of countries like Canada, Russia and then even Europe they developed here, cities mainly developed because of the development of railway lines. So, you can quote examples from Trans-Siberian Railway, Trans-Siberian Railway and then we have Trans-Canadian Railway and even in case of Japan also, it mainly developed, the cities developed mainly because of urban, that is uh, uh, with the help of development of railways. You can also talk about industrialization. Even for industries, for bringing the raw materials, they require railways because in railways, the freight cost is going to be cheaper and that is what happened in case of countries like Britain, France and then Germany, when they were in the initial phase of industrial revolution, 
they you made use of the good use of railways so that the industries got benefited so railways benefited the industry alliance so you need to talk about all these points while writing about the economic benefits and even when you talk about the social benefits so you need to make sure that it actually <coughs> the involvement of railways it has benefited even the marginalized sections of the society because marginalized sections they were able to move from one region of india to another region of india and they can uh, find any new opportunities in other states or other countries new economic opportunities new job uh, new employment opportunities all these opportunities were given only because of the introduction of railways so make sure that while writing this kind of answers you always come up with maximum number of points and also you come up with maximum number of countries as examples in your answer so talk about britain france germany russia canada and even usa for that matter they all developed only because of the uh, development of railway lines which were uh, which played a crucial role in transporting raw materials transporting labor from one region to another in the development of cities or transferring the army in case of colonial states so all this in all these areas uh, that is railways played a very predominant role so you should justify the answer so i hope you got the crux of the answer and what is the requirement of the answer so make sure you do all these things in a better manner now let's move to the next question Yes, next question is about discuss the consequences of climatic change on the food security in uh, tropical countries. See friends, this question is actually picked from the most repeated topics from your geography syllabus because we have been keep telling to the students that climatic change is very much crucial when it comes to world geography. That too in your GS paper 1 segment. And whenever they ask questions on climatic change in UPSC mains exam, they always link the climatic change concept with flood or with drought or with vegetation or with respect to occurrence of cyclone or rainfall in various regions of the world. That is how the questions will be asked. And even this year, there was no surprise if you look at the question. Because this question is very simple and very direct where they are bothered about what it discuss the consequences of climatic change on the food security in tropical countries. So here they are concerned about two things that is they are directly bothered about what is the climatic change impact or consequences on the food security and that too they are only bothered about the countries in the tropical regions. So this is what you need to be very clear again in the case of terminologies like whenever they use the word discuss as a terminology or a direct in your question make sure that when you write the structure of the answer, introduction, body, conclusion, before the conclusion, you should have a separate heading for way forward, only in case of discussion questions. This should not be missed in your answers, because this itself will carry half mark to one mark for that question. So kindly allot that as your extra component for discussion based questions. Now going into the content for the question, so they are actually bothered about what is the consequences of climatic change on food security. So if you look at food security, Food security as a concept, it talks about three things. That is, in the introduction, you can try to define food security as a concept, it involves three things. That is, it talks about accessibility to food, availability of food, and then affordability of food. So, these three things is ensured means, then only we can say that food, a country is said to be in a food secured position. So here they are also talking about one more thing is they are actually bothered about the countries which are located in the tropical region. So what you can do is you can draw the diagram to show the 23 and a half degree north that is Tropic of Cancer and then you can also show the Tropic of Capricorn which is 23 and a half degree south. So to show that this is the tropical regions of the country and what is the main advantage with this Tropical regions is that they receive enormous or high amount of sunshine. So that is one specific characteristics when it comes to tropical region. Because sun will be overhead either at the uh, 
ट्रापिक ऑफ कैंसर आर एट दि ट्रापिक ऑफ कैपरिकॉन आर एट इक्वेटर ओनली सो दीज आर दिस इज द नार्दन मोस्ट ट्रांसिट पॉइंट ऑफ सन सन विल बी ओवर एड अट दि ट्रापिक ऑफ कैंसर ड्यूरिंग समर सॉलिस्टाइज अंड इट विल बी ओवर एड एट ट्रापिक ऑफ कैपरिकॉन एट विंटर सॉलिस्टाइज and it will be over at the equator during equinox time this you would have studied in the basic ncert book now in this question after understanding the requirement of the various concepts which are asked in the question let's try to attack the question directly without getting deviating from the content if you use the common sense here let's try to understand they are bothered about what is the climatic change impact on food security or consequences on food security is first of all with respect to food the yield will be fluctuating yield fluctuation will happen whenever there is a climatic change the problem is yield will get affected second there will be frequent pest attack because of high temperature or climatic change uh, what will happen is uh, more pest will breed in the uh, agricultural fields and that will attack the uh, agricultural crops so that is one problem with in case of climatic change and second whenever there is a climatic change because of more temperature there will be high evaporation from agricultural fields high evaporation from agricultural fields so we need to spend more money for the irrigation activities because we need to supply that so because of that what will happen is there is a chance of water scarcity also in case of drier regions the chance of water scarcity is very more because of high rates of evaporation which happens on the agricultural fields so Uh, climate change has various problems when it comes to food uh, that is uh, will generate with respect to food production and even when you talk about this production indicates the availability component and when it comes to the affordability component whenever the production gets affected means that times the price of the uh, crops will go high so because supply gets affected if supply gets affected means price of food crops will increase during climatic change this is the problem inflation can also happen because of reduction in supply and increase in demand which will always lead to increase in prices so that includes the affordability component availability component we know when it is produced the availability will be ensured and accessibility so while i are talking about accessibility you have to make sure that because of the problems of various disasters disasters in that as such as flood droughts because all these events are going to be very extreme so during climatic change extreme events are very common whenever that extreme events are happening such as flood or disaster it is very difficult to assess those areas temporarily and to provide food to the people so during that time a food secured district or food secured country can become a temporarily food insecure country this is actually mentioned in your basic ncerts only so you can include that points also as one of the example and make sure that while writing the answer your answer only focuses on the tropical country so while writing all these areas give maximum example for all yield fluctuation can be noted in case of rice so basically in case of tropical regions a major cultivated crop is rice so rice will have an uh, like reduction in the crop yield so you can mention that and where it can happen you can quote some examples from india or even brazil so the countries which are located in the tropical region should be mentioned as examples then only you make sure that you are addressing the question fine so i hope you would have understood this question let's now move to the fifth question so why is the world today confronted with the crisis of availability and access to fresh water resources so here again this question is very direct and very simple but what we have to do is make sure that whenever a simple question is asked it has to be divided into various sub components that is whether the question is a sim- single question or it contains whether multiple questions within that that needs to be pointed out once that is pointed out make sure if there are multiple questions or sub questions that should be put as subheading in your answer so for example if you read this particular question it's clear that why the world today is confronted with crisis of availability and access to fresh water resources so with respect to fresh water resources they are actually bothered about two things 
So, with respect to freshwater resources, so what is the uh, problem today with respect to availability of freshwater resources and accessibility and access. So, you need to talk about these two components, why fresh waters are available less and uh, why there is a crisis of availability as well as the access to freshwater rivers. So, before going into this answer in the introduction, you need to define in a simple manner what do you understand by freshwater resources. So, you can talk about freshwater resources includes rivers, lakes and glaciers. So, make sure that uh, you are actually properly addressing the demand of the question and the definition in a simple and your own manner. It does not mean you need to come up with a predefined definition which is given in the NCRT books. You can always come up with your own definition in the introduction. So, try to define the what is the meaning of freshwater resources in a simple manner. Yes. So, once that is done, then you can talk about these two components that is availability and accessibility. So, you need to talk about availability need to talk about availability and accessibility. So, let us try to understand this. Uh, so, here what they are asking is today's situation why the world today is having a problem with respect to two things. One is with respect to availability, second is with respect to accessibility. Yes. So, I hope the screen is now visible to you. Before we are using red pen, so you might have some issues. So, I think this white color is visible to you. So, let us try to continue this. Uh, so, where we left is why the world today is confronted with crisis of availability and accessibility to with respect to freshwater resources. So, you need to talk about three things, two things in this question. One is with respect to availability, second is with respect to accessibility. You know what is the meaning of accessibility? It is reaching a particular point, whether you have proper road infrastructure, physical infrastructure that is you need to talk about various physical infrastructure that is whether you have very good connectivity to get the fresh water resources. So, you need to talk about the physical infrastructure when it comes to the problems related to physical infrastructure problem when it comes to assessing the resources. Second, availability if you see. With respect to availability, the problem today is there is a lot of over exploitation. Second, what you can do is you can also talk about because India is the most uh, population because of high population that is also one reason when it comes to the challenge in availability of freshwater resources because of more population we are consuming more fresh water because of that availability is also less. And we can also talk about urbanization because of more people getting settled in urban cities and they also start consuming more water per capita demand is actually high in cities compared to rural areas. So, you can talk about that when it comes to availability and even you can talk about the problems of pollution because industrial pollution is leading to affecting the freshwater resources because of that freshwater resources by getting unavailable or unfit for use. And even you can also talk about the various impacts of not only industrial pollution. So, you make sure that you talk about the multiple components when it comes to how this freshwater resources availability is getting challenged to today. That is with respect to our exploitation, population, urbanization, pollution and other extra human humanitarian effects which is leading to uh, like even making sure that even when you affect the rain which is coming which is making sure increase the availability of freshwater resources. You can also talk about that irregular rainfall, irregular rainfall because of climatic change. All this can be the examples for availability of freshwater resources. These are the challenges we are facing. So, uh, why there is a uh, world is facing problem today with respect to crisis of freshwater resources? These are some points you can write. 
but when it comes to accessibility you need to basically talk about the problems uh, various parts of india or as well as in the world they are facing is uh, people should have proper road facility and connectivity should be there uh, where the river water or lake water is presented so that people can go to that area and they can easily take the uh, water and come so accessibility problem will come whenever we have a physical infrastructural problem so that is one thing and even accessibility will also come the problem will come during the times of disasters that is during the times of flood drought and then earthquake so during this disasters also the places which are actually easily accessible can also turn temporarily inaccessible so during that time we will face crisis with respect to assessing the fresh water resources so make sure you write your points along all these dimensions and the only then your answers will be complete in addition to that whenever you write a geography answer make sure that you always come up with more diagrams so this is what we keep telling the students you to, should include more diagrams you should include more geography based examples across the world various mountains plateaus rivers should necessarily be mentioned because even if you see while writing pollution you need to talk about how ganga has been polluted due to various uh, humanitarian agricultural or humanitarian or industrial use due to all these reasons how the ganga has been polluted ganga and yamuna river so because of that this fresh water resource is getting unfit or unavailable temporarily for the, uh, the especially humans to consume so these are the things you should connect it with the various examples in the state and make your answer lively to the demand of the question now let's go to the next question so sixth question how are the fijards formed how are the fijards formed why do they constitute some of the most picturesque areas of the world again this is a very direct question uh, especially candidates who are coming from geography optional they will answer this very easily but those who are coming from non geographical background or non geographical optional background they might have some confusion when they hear the word fijard that is the only toughness in this question but if you would have heard or if you would have understood the concept at least once in your lifetime you would have answered this question very easily because it's a very simple question because the concept only here is the challenging segment let's try to understand that the concept so fijards how are these fijards are formed means uh, especially these fijards are formed during first what will happen is there will be glacial activity so let's take uh, any region which is having a glacial regions so first what will happen is because of glacial action a particular area will be eroded eroded and it will form a valley so that eroded areas will form valley for example this is a glacial mountain let's imagine and the movement of this glacier along the uh, this mountainous or slopey region has eroded the bottom portion and that led to a valley like future so let's try to understand this now what will happen is that in this region which has been eroded that is glacial uh, action has led to erosion of land form so this is the first criteria after the erosion of that particular land form if this is if this area is if this area is filled by sea water sea water near the coast then this region is referred as fjords it's a very simple concept previously these are the regions which have affected by glacial erosions and now temporarily uh, because of the uh, like increase in the sea level sea water has penetrated and it has filled these valleys so these are now referred as fjords and uh, these fjords have very good uh, picture school location because uh, what geographers are saying is that it contains a influx of influx of fresh water plus sea water fresh water plus sea water first thing second they are located at the foothills of mountains and even uh, these are like foothills of mountains and even if you see where these fjords are majorly located is that in the near the scandinavian countries such as norway sweden finland 
that can be given as the example especially european countries there the main advantage is that they also have very lot of beautiful mountains surrounded by these valleys and this will serve as a beautiful picturesque location and there will be influx of fresh water and sea water in this area and even this place is also famous for various tourism activities and in addition to that these features are the locations which also receive from the northern region from the that is the concept of northern lights which you would have studied so northern lights are also visible in this regions so due to these various advantages these features actually they constitute the most picturesque areas of the world so if you do this by explain by using the diagram if you could explain the concept followed by that if you talk about some of the advantages why this region is called as picturesque uh, regions of the world along with that if you come up with more examples in your answer where it is happening then only you are going to impress the examiner so those candidates who don't understand the meaning of the figures they can't even write any points related to this so make sure that whenever you read geography uh, you should know about the various landforms which are created in geomorphology chapter so try to give maximum attention to that now let's go into the next <coughs> next question why is southwest monsoon called purviya in the bhojpur region how has this directional seasonal wind system influenced the cultural ethos of the region so this is the question compared to all the first six questions this is the only question i think they have reached the th three lines till now upsc has uh, first six questions they have asked in one or two lines only so that is the beauty this is the first year we are seeing a change in trend with respect to the way the questions are asked because us upsc usually will be giving lot of sub questions but this time they have asked you very direct simple question if you know the answer for the question or the content you can write it in a beautiful manner or if you have a proper common sense to understand the demand of the question also you can get maximum marks so now let's try to understand this particular question here why is the south so here the question itself contains two components first component focuses on why is the southwest monsoon called purviya in bhojpur region so first thing that is the first component of the question we should address second component is how this directional seasonal wind system influenced the cultural ethos of the region so there are two components and your answer should also contains two subheadings for this question so here while addressing this particular part of the question you need to understand what is the you should mention the bhojpur region with the help of diagram that is it is located at the border of up plus bihar region so you should mention this to the examiner very clearly once you do that you are going to get at least half a mark to one mark per that question so it's actually located in the northern alluvial plain region at the up bihar border that is the bhojpur region and what is the main advantage of this bhojpur region or how this region experience southwest monsoon is that when the southwest monsoon first strike the kerala coast it bifurcates into two one is an arabian sea branch second is the bay of bengal branch now what is the advantage with bay of bengal branches it started hitting the Uh, that is a meghalayan foothills after that meghalayan plateau once it started hitting it start gets deviated and start moving towards the that is the up bihar regions so here while reaching that if you see observe uh, for the up bihar these winds are actually rising from the eastern part of its region that's why these winds are also called as easterly winds or in case of local area in hindi they call this as purviya purviya means so it is also called by as easterly in that region in hindi they call locally as that easterly because in geography we will rename a wind from the direction from which it is coming since it is coming from the eastward region towards up bihar it is called easterly so you need to convince the examiner very clearly why this wind is originating from the eastern region because when it gets bifurcated from the southwest monsoon so it gets divided into two branches that is arabian sea and bay of bengal and bay of bengal branch after hitting the meghalayan plateau it gets it gets actually deviated towards the up bihar region and it starts moving easterly and it's called easterly in this bhojpur region once you give this clarification along with the diagram then you are going to impress the examiner now let's go into the second part of the question 
how this directional seasonal winds influence the cultural ethos of the country or cultural uh, ethos of that region. See friends, uh, what is the most important thing when it comes to answer writing is that you should always understand each and every key word or terminologies which are used in the question. If here if you see, if you understand what is the meaning of cultural ethos properly means, then you are actually going to address the question very easily. But if you don't understand it, then you are going to deviate from the question. So, here while writing the cultural ethos, you should talk about what is the various dress style and then festivals and then various literature, music, dance. So, all these are the various cultural factors which get developed in this region and how this directional wind or seasonal wind is influencing them means generally whenever this wind will happen, people will feel very happy and they will all will be engaged in agricultural work in this region, UP Bihar region. So, they will feel a sense of unity. So, they will feel a sense of unity and they feel a sense of happy. Whenever, whenever this southwest monsoon is touching the UP Bihar region in the name of Purvi or Easterly wind, UP Bihar region people, they will celebrate the monsoon by welcoming the monsoon. Second, they will also feel united because they all are united in the agricultural production process. And in addition to that, because if it is a very good monsoon harvest season or where they received very good rainfall during this particular year means the people of this region, they are going to celebrate their festivals their dresses, dress style, music, dances, all these cultural patterns will be replicated in a very good manner. Suppose if it is an El Nino year or if the monsoon rainfall is affected means then the cultural ethos or cultural that year the cultural pattern or lifestyle will also get affected. So, you need to convey this uh, very nicely to the examiner along with the various harvesting festivals which are celebrated in the name of uh, Pongal, Lokeri, or whatever names we call various harvesting festivals across regions of India, Ugadi. So, make sure that you represent these names in your answer to fetch that extra marks. Now, let us move into the next question. So, do you think marriage is a sacrament is losing its value in modern India? So, this question is picked from your society segment in case of GS paper 1. So, first what you have to do is whenever you read a question, try to identify the syllabus component. Once that is done, then your job is going to be very easy. Now, let us try to understand the question. They are asking, do you think marriage as a sacrament is losing its value in modern India? Here, what generally we will advise to the students is that to go with a balanced approach rather than taking a single stand on any particular issue. Do not say that marriage is losing its value today in India. On the other side also do not say that marriage is not losing its value. What you can always do is that try to give a balanced approach in your answer. So, this balanced approach will always is going to uh, impress the UPSC examiner. One thing is they are expecting you to write answer in an administrative manner. So, an administrator, IAS or IPS officer should have balanced approach in his answer writing. That is first thing. Second requirement is, the advantage of writing a balanced approach is that you can al always come up with more points supporting the answer and taking a stand against the answer, thereby ending up contributing more points to the answer and ending up getting more marks for the answer. These are the some things you should keep doing. So, what you can do is, yes you can say or no you can say. So, marriage is... Uh, losing its value. So, you can say marriage losing its value. Other side you say not losing its value. So, try to write some at least 3-4 points on each side. That is enough to fetch you. Uh, that is a mark of 5-6 to six marks for this question and that will land up in you getting a very good mark in GS paper 1. So, these are simple things you should keep doing. Suppose if you are taking a stand in this case, you will be contributing maximum 4 or 5 points. But the one who is taking balanced approach, you would be writing 6 to 7 points very easily. So, that is the reason we keep telling to the students, you should use your brain in a smart manner. That is why what these are the things we say that you should have common sense to answer. Now, coming here, so marriage as a sacrament is losing its value. So, what are the things you can talk about? You can talk about the today's, that is live-in relation. 
yes and more number of joint family system has been broken down to nuclear family and the future of a nuclear family will be also moving to no family system so because of live in culture and then even because of various modernization values and because of globalization people get influenced that uh, it is marriage as an institution is losing its value because many of the people now they are encouraging to live in living culture and uh, even after the impact of globalization the marriage as an institution is losing its value like in case of western countries uh, they actually live in generally nuclear family and no family system but in case of india for a large number of time it was a joint family system later it has moved because uh, to nuclear family system with the coming up of more job opportunities in cities and today if you see many of the people they are forced to live isolationly in a single so that is considered to be no family system where they also many of them are also considering not marry uh, to not exercise this option of marriage in their life so this is considered to be no family system so you can talk about all these things which are uh, actually coming and challenging the marriage as its value today but when you want to support it you also talk about what are the positive things what are the positive things uh, when it comes to uh, marriage as an institution which is not losing its value is that today if you see marriage is actually even today also many people are marrying because of the various family functions or socialization functions which are happening so even today also marriage is happening in india because of various caste system proper religious or cultural values so you can also talk about because of the cultural values so family functions because a person has to uh, generally go for a birth of the child so then only uh, they say that his hereditary rights can be transferred at least for that family functions even today many people are getting married and even for preserving the culture and the dignity of their family many people they tend to marry so even today you can say that in case of india marriage is uh, not losing its value and it is saving a most important value it is also doing a proper socialization so socialization means inculcation of values to the children and if the value system is proper then those are the children who are actually going to uh, follow the system of marriage but if they lose their socialization value and because of globalization they will turn more westernized where they will end up living in a no family system or a living system so these are the things if you give proper approach to your answer with proper argument should be present make sure that your answers are proper arguments are debates and it it, it should all it should also have more examples from various regions of india or across the world so but generally try to limit it to the indian society itself so because the question is bothered about modern india so if you do these two components properly in your answer you are going to fetch those uh, minimum mark which can be expected that is out of 10 if you have a proper content you can expect 5 mark but if you have a very good value addition with diagrams arguments and examples you are going to fetch that extra mark now let's move to the next question so this particular question is all about explain why suicide among young women is increasing in indian society again this question has been picked from your society segment of gs paper 1 yes and this particular question is very straight forward so students need to uh, start attacking the question from the question uh, when they start answering the question from line number 1 you don't need to revolve around the question because they are very clear the demand of the question is they are asking you why suicide among young women is increasing in indian society see the causes of suicide are multiple reasons but while writing the reasons here make sure you give a maximum weightage to social economic reasons followed by cultural and historical or other reasons also so you here if you write the answer for this particular question the reasons for suicide suicide among young woman so reasons for suicide among young woman so for writing this answer what you can do is uh, make sure that what are the various ways why women are committing suicide in uh, while reading newspapers you would have come across 
so these are the things you should remember from, from your current affairs knowledge and try to include that as a content in this particular question to the demand of the question. That is what's your smartness or intelligence in doing the answer writing here. So generally uh, women they commit suicide because of uh, that is the emotional mental health issue mental if they suffer from mental health problem their peace gets affected or there is an occurrence of domestic violence such as dowry or there is an occurrence of sexual violence or there is uh, more uh, they are doing more discrimination for women especially uh, in case of during the birth or after the birth after the birth the woman discrimination is also uh, leading to uh, motivate them these women to face uh, uh, suicide and even there is a more chance of social isolation today because today in a modern world in a globalized world many of the women are forced to live in individualism where they tend to end up have a very thin friend circle and their socialization will be getting affected in this process where they will also face because of isolation uh, they will also tend to end up committing suicide so even you can al also talk about because of the uh, less socialization or or you can talk about uh, because of the uh, more amount of technology which has intruded in the society the human relationship has been not given importance in today's society because of that uh, poor networking social networking or less socialization which is identified in today's society more number of women are actually committing suicide so you can talk about all this so in addition you should also talk about the various uh, so women also commit especially women also commit suicide because of the various social discrimination this happens especially for the SCST communities so you can talk about vulnerable sections and even the people who are uh, economically who are affected so economically who are vulnerable are people who are affected by BPL people. So due to economic reasons also many people they commit suicide. So you can talk about all these things in your answer. So while in social discrimination talk also about caste discrimination which is still prevalent in case of Indian society because of that and even while doing inter caste marriages many are forced to commit suicide. So make sure you talk about various these uh, causes along with proper lively examples across various regions of India. This is what will enhance your answer writing. Now let us move into the next question. So 10th question here they are bothered about child cutting is now being replaced by mobile phones. So discuss the impact of socialization of children. So child cutting as a concept you should know. So you should talk about it in the introduction. So what is child cutting? It is hugging the child and here this has been now replaced by mobile phones with the incoming of technology. Now uh, not only children in the early stage are exposed to uh, this kind of uh, mobile phones and other iPad and other technological items. Because of that they also suffer from various health problems also. So now let us try to understand this question uh, as per the demand of the question let us try to answer this question. So what they are asking is a first statement uh, child cutting is now replaced by mobile phone. So you can give some reasons to that. Second part is about discuss the impact of socialization of children. So here while talking about uh, impact you should talk about positive impact as well as the negative impact. That is the one area which students will miss. So you have to talk about both the things. Second while since this question is about discuss in the structure of the answer introduction body and conclusion before conclusion you should have way forward. So these are some things you should not miss while reading the question very clearly. Once the question is properly understood let us try to uh, like address the question properly. So in the introduction itself you should try to define what is the meaning of child cutting. So once you do that. Uh, then you can talk about why there is a more uh, intrusion or introduction of technology today. So for that what you can say is today because of the coming of globalization after 1991 India has been exposed to uh, import of various technological items from other countries and that has enabled these people to get aware of various smartphones or mobile phones. So you can talk about it. So link it with the concept of globalization. 
because of that we are getting more replacement by mobile phones so what is its impact so impact while talking about impact what you have to do is you have to make sure you write the impact in a proper manner that is positive impact and negative impact so the negative impacts you can talk about see a children who is using more of mobile telephones rather than child cutting which is going to happen because the positiveness of child cutting is that the students will feel more trust emotionally more connected and their brain development will be more and even uh, what many scientists are saying is that the children will also feel more energetic and more happy because of this uh, process of child cuddling so you can say that a uh, brain development and even various motor functions of brain so all these for all these activities child cuddling is considered to be very essential but today if you see this has been replaced by the advancement of technology so start your answer by explaining the positives of child cuddling first try to define in the introduction about child cuddling then talk about the positives of child cuddling and today with the emergence of technology this has been challenged or replaced so in that way you are trying to address the first half of the question now coming to the second half with the coming up of this child child cuddling getting replaced by mobile phones today there is more individualism there is a practice of more individualisms and even <coughs> there is a chance of children getting isolated and losing the trust and even they will lose the uh, they will lose the socialization values which they can get from the mother at the early stage their brain development health and other emotional connection might they might be losing due to the earlier stage so these are some of the problems when it comes to uh, negatives of uh, child cuddling when it is getting replaced by mobile phones but it also has some positives what are the positives you can say nowadays if you see kids who are, who are under 2 years 3 years or 5 years only they started they are using now youtube and various mobile phones so this enables the children to have easy adoption of technology or awareness of technology is coming awareness of technology is coming at the early stage so this, that is one advantage second because of the awareness it will increase the it will increase the educational level so it will increase the educational level because children can learn many new things in this case of by using these technologies so various poems rhymes or even mathematical operations they can use it if they are using it in a positive manner it is going to benefit them but if they are getting deviated for example inappropriate content inappropriate content is going to spoil them for example the content which is on sexual content or even violent content which are not prescribed for children's if they are exposed to this kind of contents their emotions and physical development or their thought process might be getting affected at the early stage so we should make sure that they are not getting exposed to inappropriate content because that will create negative impact on them but positive impact is it will improve their awareness and then accessibility to various technologies that will improve the digitization in uh, in the various countries so these are some things you should uh, not miss while answering this particular question now let's try to move to the next question so 11th question what are the main features of vedic society and religion do you think some of the features are still prevalent in indian society again this question you should identify where this is question is picked from while reading the question only you know it is again picked from society component of your gs paper 1 and here what are the various sub questions which has been asked will let's try to point out that so it contains two sub component what are the main features of vedic society and religion that is first component second component is do you think some of the features are still prevailing in indian society so this is second component this is first component so while addressing the answer uh, the structure should have introduction body conclusion and the body body of the answer should have two sub topics one is on that is features of vedic society so you can break the first component into uh, two more components one is features of vedic society second features of vedic 
religion so and then on the second half of the component they are asking uh, do you think some of the futures are still prevailing so futures prevailing in indian society so here since they have asked you a question do you think some of the futures are still prevalent in indian society so what are the futures which are prevalent if you say if you agree with that you should make sure that you write some points to that if you differ with that make sure what are the futures which are missing today so this is a very simple direct question provided you understand the question properly and put the subheadings properly means you are going to fetch the maximum marks for the question because writing a content for this kind of questions is going to be very simple because the futures of vedic society are first it had a varna system so what do you mean by varna system it is the exercise of are categorizing the society into various categories such as brahmanas brahmanas kshatriyas then vaishyas then shudras so shudras are the one who are supposed to serve the other three so based on this they gave the occupation to them so you can talk about varna system and there is a more prevalence of patriarchal society so you can talk about this thing patriarchal society means it is a society which has been dominated by men so society which has been dominated by men even today also majority of indian society is patriarchal only few societies such as karo gasi jaintia in meghalaya tribal societies are matriarchal and in kerala we have nayar communities who are matriarchal society so this also you should understand you would have studied while reading the society questions but here while explaining it you should not miss these two points in your answer and coming to the vedic religion what are its basic features of vedic religion is that vedic religion was supposed to contain various enormous rituals so these rituals are considered to be very elaborate and specific and they have been clearly mentioned in case of vedic religion so you can include that in your answers and one more thing when it comes to the features of vedic religion is that many of these vedic uh, uh, that is uh, the man, uh, various scriptures or literatures has been codified in the vedas time only rigvedic time so you can talk about it now coming to uh, features prevailing in indian society even today if you see many of the features are prevalent because you can talk about varna system even today we have varna system in practice but really uh, the sudras cannot be discriminated as we discriminated in the old society but ideally we classify the people in india by the uh, various caste system so even though there is no varna system is there today we have something called as caste system which is actually a by product of this varna system so you can talk about that then you can also talk about the prevalence of patriarchal society which is still dominant in various parts of india and you can also talk about the rituals because religious rituals are something even in many of the temples of uh, india they actually practice the ancient rituals which has been prescribed in this vedas so by quoting this example you can conclude that there are some futures which are still prevalent in indian society such as caste system so you can quote the caste system of nayar society in case of kerala as example patriarchal society you can quote all the reddies all various caste communities are dominant communities in india are patriarchal society only so you can quote that and while mentioning rituals you can quote the various rituals which are still practiced in temples today so by this means you are trying to answer the question completely now let's go to the 12th question what are the major technological what are the major technological changes introduced during the sultanate period and how did these technological changes influence the indian society so here while reading the question itself you should understand very clearly there are two components in the question so this question itself also should contain two sub topics in your answer so the first sub topic in the body of the answer should address the first part of the question and second sub topic should address the second part of the question now so what are the major technological changes so let's try to put this in the sub topic way major technological changes during sultanate period so quote about this 
and you can also quote about the second thing how did this technological challenges how did they influence the indian society so you need to mention uh, this sub topics in your answer compulsorily and here the question is in particular talking about sultanate period so the, there are various contributions which has been done by sultanate period which you would have studied in your our past two in your medieval book uh, that is uh, in ncert seventh standard our past two you would have studied about sultanate period and themes in indian history part 2 in your 12th standard book again on medieval india chapter you would have studied about the sultanates and in case of old ncerts in medieval india uh, you would have again talked about or studied about the sultanate period but that is not the main concern here Uh, even if you know some points related to these sultanates what they have done you can write a very beautiful answer because they are bothered only about the technological changes so by technological changes they have introduced arches and domes and they have introduced canal irrigation and they have introduced metals such as brass bronze and they have also introduced gunpowder and they are also introduced various cotton textile goods and they have also laid foundation for silk products so you should write about all these things because these all these are the unique contributions of the sultanate kingdom so these are the technological changes which they have done uh, so once after mentioning this and discussing on these topics then you should say that how did these technological changes influence the indian society for example what you can do is here while writing the answers make sure that see for example in case of agriculture by introducing agriculture canal irrigation agricultural production increased so you can say that how it influences indian society second industrial goods industrial goods were increased third what you can also talk about is the usage of various gunpowder and metallurgical industries it provided better defense and security defense and security so we can use these gunpowder to fight against other countries also as a war weapon or a military weapon it can be used so these are some ways in which sultanate kingdom tried to influence the indian society by empowering agricultural industrial and military arena so you can talk about this and you can conclude the answer now let's move into the next question so how did the colonial rule affect the tribals in india and what was the tribals response to the colonial oppression again friends if you read this particular question you should try to understand where this particular question was asked from so how did the colonial rule affect the tribals in india so this question is picked from modern history segment so once you understand or identify the subject then finding answer for the question is going to be very simple so now we let's try to understand there are two components in the question first component is how did the colonial rule affect the tribals in india this is the first component and second component is what was the tribal's response to the colonial oppression so naturally since two components are asked in the question your answer should also contain two sub two sub topics so once you identify that now let's try to point out these sub headings in the answer and let's try to generate some points for this answer so how did the colonials rule affect the tribals so what was the tribal's response tribal's rep- response to colonial oppression so these two subheadings should be present in your answer only then the examiner will get to know that you have understood the question in right sense and you are trying to write something related to the question if your subheading itself is wrong means or it is incomplete means or you are trying to generate some confusing subheading means the exa- you not only you will be confused and you will be writing irrelevant content the examiner who evaluates your answer paper he will also more confused so make sure 
you have a very good clarity in writing the same sentences as subheadings in your answer and try to generate maximum points so that you can fetch maximum marks in the answer. Now for this question, how did the colonial rule affect the tribals in India? Colonial rule have actually affected the people first by land alienation. How land alienation? Because of the land revenue system. Second, they were forced to work as forced laborers. And even those people who are isolated from the tribal areas and they are shifted to the cities, most of them were actually working as forced laborers. And those who are inside the forest, they were forced to grow, actually they were forced to grow more cash crops. So these cash crops, they affected the soil fertility. Second, colonial rules also affected the religious area because uh, religious conversion was very active during the tribal area. Uh, so especially during British's time, many tribals were forced to convert to from Hinduism to Christianity and because of this also many tribals, they forcefully, uh, they revolted against the British. So you can talk about religious conver conversion as well as the various kinds of discrimination and uh, social discrimination which has been prevailing and how these tribals have been exploited from their area and how they were forced to move out from the tribal regions and settle in neighboring villages as wage laborers. So you should talk about all these things but make sure that you also talk about the various educational health problems of tribals because Britishers did not improve anything about the educational or health problem of the tribals and most of them were living in isolation and their cultural values were intact and they were living as a joint family or a collective system. So they repelled against the outsiders and when these outsiders, they started attacking these tribal people, most of them were technologically deprived and they could not withstand in the war against the Britishers and were forced to uh, fight and lose in the battle. So what is the response to the colonial oppression is that uh, the tribals came out with something called as Sanyasi Rebellion. Sanyasi Rebellion. Second what you can write is you can also talk about Mundal Rebellion. So this is something around 1855 to 56. This is around 1899 to 1900. So you can quote this as examples to show that the tribals are themselves, are, tribals are also, they oppressed, they, uh, they fight, they fighted against the British because of their oppression and exploitation. But uh, most of them were actually unable to win against the Britishers since they lacked the modern weapon in real sense. Because they lack modern weapon and strategy against the Britishers to fight as a unit. Uh, so that is the reason tribals, they lost the battle against the uh, Britishers. So you should talk about all these components in a proper manner along with various tribals examples across various regions. So once you do that, you are going to get the maximum mark. Fine, now let's move into the next question friends. <coughs> 14th question. Here the question is, they are asking you to do comment. So comment on the resource potentials of the long coastal line of India and highlight the status of natural hazard preparations in, the, in these areas. Again, this question is asked from your geography segment of GS paper 1. So questions on geography should always be represented in diagrams. Without drawing diagram, kindly uh, don't, draw a, don't write any geography answers in exam hall. Yes, this is the thing which we have been telling to students over the years because whenever you draw a diagram, it conveys to the examiner you are very good in concept clarity. You are also going to use less usage of words and for every diagram you are going to fetch extra marks. With these multiple benefits, don't neglect the inclusion of diagram in the exam alpha geography answers. Fine friends, let's now go into addressing this question. Again, this is a very easy question which you can answer just by reading properly the NCRTs multiple times because you don't read really any uh, like textbooks to a higher level or do PhD in geography to answer this question. It requires just a simple common sense. If you read the question, they are bothered about comment on the resource potential. So first thing what they are asking is resource potential of long coastline of India. So this is first thing you need to write and the second second subtopic or sub uh, is there as this highlight the status of natural status of natural hazard preparedness. 
so in india so these are the two headings you should necessarily put so that you convey to the examiner you are very clear with the understanding the question and addressing the question once that is clear writing answer is going to be very simple so let's now try to understand and address the question so what is the resource potential in the long coastal line regions of india so what do you have to do you have to think about full coastal line regions of india what are the resources we have resource for that is wind energy then tidal energy and then you can catch fisheries in the coastal regions you can do prawn cultivation or prawn harvesting harvesting ponds <coughs> and you can also use this uh, various uh, uh, what to say coastal resources for producing oil and gas resource and there is also mineral resources like uh, thorium thorium thora um thorium and monazite sand and the monazite sand of the kerala we have useful mineral resources also so you need to talk about all these energy resources as well as mineral resources and other marine resources which can be uh, generated especially along the coastal lines along with the advantage of its tourism potential and employment generation through these activities so these are some things you need to talk about in your answer but when it comes to the status of natural preparedness in india you need to make sure that you talk about various national disasters such as floods droughts at one head and earthquakes at another head and tsunamis at other head when it comes to floods and droughts we have indian meteorological department which gives early warning whenever uh, rainfall is going to uh, bring out flood to a particular region so when it comes to earthquakes earthquakes are actually measured at the richter scale and mercalli scale and based on this intensity we try to classify the regions of india into various zones of earthquakes among them the most uh, earthquake vulnerable regions are the himalayan regions of india and when it comes to himalayan regions india is advising these areas not to go for Uh, that is a huge apartment construction or avoid the construction in this uh, multiple apartment construction or high rise buildings should be avoided in case of northern regions even while locating nuclear reactors we are not locating in case of northern regions of india because of its uh, seismic activity so you can mention this but when it comes to tsunami we have tsunami early warning center in case of hyderabad so you need to talk about first thing is early warning systems in india early warning systems in india with respect to status of natural preparedness second what is the level of training we are giving to the people in the coastal lines to prepare to create any awareness among the people and what kind of infrastructure we have developed along the coastal areas so that they don't get affected by any kind of climatic change or sea level rise or any flood drought or any kind of tsunami activities which arise from the region whether we are going to build any infrastructure so whether we have done it so these are the things you should talk about and talk about the status of preparedness in india is come come it's considered to be somewhat satisfied because we have early warning systems to our the people we have provided training to the uh, indian defense and various security agencies to take care of the disaster management activities we also make sure that we construct a land sea wall along the coastal lines of india so that in future tsunami whenever it happens it does not affect the coastal communities and fishing communities in particular so these are the things you should mention in your answer necessarily and you should make use of some diagrams in your answer to fetch the extra marks now let's move to the next question friends so here the question is about identify and discuss the identify and discuss the factors responsible for the diversity of natural vegetation in india so the question contains two components this is the first component second component is assess the significance of wildlife sanctuaries in rainforest regions of india here the question is very clear with two components so your answer should also contains two subheadings in your answer so let's try to put the subheadings first so identify and discuss the factors responsible for diversity of natural 
vegetation in India. So, this is first heading, so which you should mention and the second subheading is, so assess the significance of wildlife sanctuaries. Significance of wildlife sanctuaries in rainforest regions of the India. So, rainforest regions of India. So, these are the two subheadings should be present in your answer. Only then your answer is going to properly complete the demand of the question. Now, going into the uh, subtopics one by one. So, what they are asking is what are the factors which are responsible for diversity of natural vegetation. So, you know very well why in India we have varieties of varieties of vegetation because of varieties of rainfall because of varieties of latitude. So, then we can say because of varieties in altitude and you can say because of varieties of soil and you can also talk about uh, the varieties in case of various other related factors that is uh, geographical factors, climatological factors, topographical factors, evolutionary factors. So, you can also talk about the various evolutionary factors which are present so that the natural uh, diversity in a region is huge. Now, second point when you go, significance of wildlife sanctuaries in India, you know very well why we are actually creating wildlife sanctuaries, especially in rainy forest regions because we wanted to preserve, we wanted to preserve biodiversity. By biodiversity, we mean both plants and animals. We also wanted to protect endemic plants. We also make sure these wildlife sanctuaries in the rainy forest region, they will provide various ecosystem services. By ecosystem services, we mean purification, purification of air, water, all these are useful ecosystem services which are provided by environment or trees to humans. So, you should talk about all these things necessarily in your answer along with diagrams examples and if possible wherever possible data if you could include to support your arguments then you are in a position to get maximum marks for this question. Now let us try to move to the next question friends. Why did human development fail to keep pace with economic development in India? Again here the question is very direct and this question is picked from your NCRT books only because in NCRTs in economics you would have studied about uh, the concept of economic development and human development. But this question is picked from your geographical aspect. So, from the geographical component, this particular question is asked and here they are bothered about why did human development fail to keep pace with economic development. So, the question is very direct. In case of India, human development is not happening but economic development is happening. So, why there is a lag in case of uh, human development with respect to economic development. So, what you can say is, so you say that uh, human development, human development fail to keep pace with economic development. So, if you put this as a subheading and try, try to write because GDP growth rate did not reach all sections equally. So, that is one reason because some people would have got benefited more, rich people, poor people would not have got benefited. So, there is a difference between rich and poor. Because of that, poor people would have been affected by poverty, rich people would have been benefited. So, you can talk about that. So, due to that, there are some people would not have got human development, but economic development, some people would have got. That is the reason we have lag in that. And second, we can also talk, uh, talk about because of lack of proper education, we can also talk about lack of health facilities and you can also talk about the various other problems in case of India because in India majority of the people are actually dependent on agricultural activities and that is almost nearly uh, 45 to 50 percent of Indian population are dependent on agriculture. But in case of India majority of the growth is actually concentrated our majority of the people are actually dependent on agriculture, but its contribution to GDP is very less. So, its contribution to GDP is less. So, because of that also, uh, many people are forced to their live in poverty because of that human development did not happen. 
and you can also talk about the various uh, problems with respect to infrastructure or infrastructural problem especially with respect to tribal areas hilly areas and then backward region areas so these are the areas still they are facing problem where the fruits are roots of uh, fruits of benefit of economic development is unable to reach the sections so here general kindly talk about the hilly terrains which are located in uh, northern areas of kashmir jammu and kashmir is posing the problem for continuous development of railways so even you can talk about uh, the northeastern regions uh, which is uh, actually having poor connectivity problem so because of this poor connectivity problem they are not actually getting any benefit out of economic development uh, the benefits which are coming from economic development is not reaching the people mainly because of poor connectivity especially in the northeastern region so these are some reasons which you can quote to justify that in case of india human development is failing to catch with the economic development also talk about the human developmental index the rank of india which is still considered to be around in the range of 130 out of 183 countries india is in that position only in the last 5 years so we need to improve or invest more on education health infrastructure human infrastructure especially to contribute more to human development as well as to economic development now moving to the next question that is the 17th question so here from being a a uh, net uh, food ex importer in 1960s india has emerged as a net food exporter to the world provide reasons again this question is picked from directly from your economics ncert of 11th standard so you can go through that uh, so for writing this answer for this particular question this comes under your geographical component so you need to draw diagrams in your question especially to address this question now let's try to identify how many components are there in the question so from being a net food importer in 1960s india has emerged as a net food exporter to the world so they are asking you to provide reasons so before writing this answer in the introduction say that india till 1965 it was considered to be a food importing nation mainly because of the there is a program called as pl480 scheme under this scheme india was dependent on usa for the import of wheat which was coming from the ship and that is called as ship to mouth scheme so we are actually dependent on other countries to provide food to us uh, so because in india there was a serious drought here in 1965 66 so uh, we were generally a majorly a food importing country till that point of time later in 1966 67 india went for agricultural revolution which we call it as green revolution so green revolution was able to increase food production and food productivity in the country especially on rice and wheat in our country so are we able to increase it so india was able to emerge as a net exporter to the world so while exporting today if you see that is from 1966 to 67 india was able to increase the production in rice and then wheat but this condition was going to be very normal till the time till 1990s because till 1990s india was operating majorly uh, it has not open its borders completely to the other countries to trade with other country but after globalization that is after globalization or lpg new policy or the new economic policy of lpg that is liberalization privatization and globalization followed by that india was able to open up its border and now we are able to export many of the goods successfully to other countries for example today india is exporting rice to middle east countries middle east countries japan and india is also exporting fruits to usa and then india is also exporting processed that is we are also india is also one of the country which is uh, importing Uh, that is oil and petroleum in large reserves at the same time we are also exporting this in large quantity because india is one of the country which is having a good technology in refining petroleum resources so our exports will also include exports will also include items such as that is refined petroleum resources 
and we are also but generally try to talk about only the food items don't try to deviate from the topic so you can talk about rice wheat and then uh, fruits and uh, even today if you see india is trying to export its uh, pulses as well as this uh, millets because we have now recently our government has introduced a scheme called magarishi in the g20 where we are trying to promote millets awareness and its consumption among the world countries because india is considered to be having a very good production in millets quantity if you could export if you find a market in outside countries we can export this item also so overall if you see from 1960s to till today india is able to uh, import its uh, from the importing status to an exporting status we are able to do this due to various reasons starting from green revolution and then due to globalization and then you can also talk about because of better better uh, investment in irrigation and then due to various policies government policies that as government policies such as msp policy and then due to various export subsidies so you can quote due to various these government policies and then <coughs> even we are also having very good uh, that is uh, infrastructure good infrastructure for storage so fca is having its huge good owns where it can store it and then it can sell it to uh, domestic as well as to other countries which are in need so due to all these reasons by working on the infrastructure by working on the export import after globalization by providing a better policy decision and by providing or investing in dams and other irrigation facilities in the country as well as by going for better technology through green revolution and through globalization the opportunities for india has improved a lot where india is not only able to increase the food production because of green revolution today we are able to export it to many other countries of the world starting from middle east uh, and then uh, countries of uh, japan and then even american countries such as north america and to europe also so kindly try to include all these points in your answer along with look very quoting the various food crops as well as various examples of countries now moving into the 18th question so does urbanization lead to more segregation or marginalization of the poor in indian metropolis so this question friends is picked from your society component in gs paper 1 so always when you write the society component you should talk about various communities and you should bring in debates and you should bring in the social and economic dimension in your answer necessarily so going into the question the question is bothered about does urbanization lead to more segregation or marginalization so in indian metropolis so what you can do is you can talk about segregation and you can also talk about marginalization yes so you can do two things here you can first either support it and say some points related to it and then you can oppose it and then you can say some points related to it so that you end up getting more points to write in the exam hall and end up getting also more marks in the exam so whenever you talk about segregation segregation can happen at the level of social level social segregation so social segregation can be seen in case of slums and then sc st households colonies and then with respect to versus gated communities this is still prevalent so rich people or dominant caste people will be living in one side and uh, other side you will have the reserved uh, marginalized vulnerable sections which are having their settlement pattern in villages even if you go to villages today the dominant communities might be living in the center of the city but this vulnerable uh, population will be living in the vicinity or the end of the city somewhere in the corner of the villages or uh, rural areas because they might be belonging to uh, that is uh, sc or st communities and they might be discriminated at the uh, village level so because of that a gated social segregation might be happening in india so you can quote that so does urbanization lead to uh, more segregation means what you can say is yes because even today in cities also we will find enormous number of slums not only in villages even today in cities if people are forced to move from 
villages to cities because of opportunities. Not only in villages we get this pattern, even in cities we have slums and uh, colonies which are present, where economically marginalized sections are present, whereas gated communities are present in other parts of the world. So you can talk about it and you can also talk about economic segregation. Economic segregation means here we talk about the distinction between rich and poor who gets discriminated with respect to their settlement pattern. So it is also leading to more segregation spatially. So spatial segregation is also there and social segregation is also there. So talk about all these kind of segregation. Spatial segregation means that is the first component. How the dominant caste are living in one part and uh, the vulnerable sections are living in the corner. So talk about this and coming to the marginalization. Here talk about social marginalization. Talk about economic marginalization. Talk about political marginalization. So talk about all these three things for S component also and as well as for no component also. So you should justify your answer. Yes, urbanization is leading to more segregation because in cities today we also have uh, slums and uh, gated communities. So they are getting segregated, especially also uh, caste communities are getting segregated. Uh, that is rich and poor are also economically getting segregated when it comes to cities. And even marginalized also is felt in case of, uh, because of more urbanization, because many of the people are SC, ST communities, they might be working in lowly paid jobs, where they not only because of their social discrimination, they did not had proper education in their villages. And when they come to cities, they will be working mostly as wage laborers or casual wage laborers. Whereas the dominant caste people, because of very good education, they might be working in a formal sector, where these people are might be working in informal sector. And economically also, if you see, the marginalized people might not be getting proper social security benefits when it comes to, uh, that is in cities. So social security benefits might not be there. That is gratuity fund, provident fund, and even proper paid leave also will not be there especially for these marginalized communities. Political marginalization will happen where uh, even though there is a reservation for SCST communities in case of panchayats and other bodies, but these communities are getting underrepresented or even when they get elected also, uh, they don't exercise these rights completely because most of the times women who stand in the elections, their rights are actually exercised by the husband only. And even when these uh, dominant communities are getting uh, elected in the elections, uh, the real power they are not getting. So we quote various examples from across India to show that urbanization is actually leading to more marginalization and segregation. That can be one part of answer. Suppose if you want to say no to this, you contradict all the things whatever we have discussed and try to balance the answer in the end. But since this question is asking you a question only, you can have the liberty to choose yes as well as no or you can take a balanced approach. But you can always go with one approach for this question. Since you have more content to write, you can say you can take a clear decision. Yes, it is leading to more segregation and try to give various categories and examples in your answer. Thereby you address the question properly. Now moving into the 19th question. So 19th question is about why is caste identity in India both fluid and static? Very very simple question and this question has been picked from your society NCRT book only. In NCRT you have a clear chapter on caste system in your society book, 11th standard and 12th standard book. So those who have read that book they will be very finding it very easy to answer this question. And even those sociology optional students can find very easy to answer. For the students of other optionals, what you have to do is you have to clear, develop a clear insight and conceptual understanding when it comes to addressing this question. But because you need to give various examples to justify the answer. That is, why is caste identity? It is considered to be both static and fluid. So what you can do? You say caste system is static in some areas and it is fluid in some areas. Where it is static, it is static still in case of marriages. It is Then it is still uh, dominant or it is still static when it comes to uh, that is the kind of society. 
societal values that is patriarchal values still predominant in our society and even when it comes to social discrimination so if even when it comes to social discrimination caste system is predominant in our society so caste is going to stay where, where are the areas it is staying still where, where whenever they go for marriages still they happen it on the basis of marriage and uh, even when uh, societal values such as patriarchal value has been predominantly influenced by this ancient uh, structures uh, traditional values uh, and social discrimination also happens because of caste system today also in india many caste are especially lower caste scsts are getting discriminated so in that manner caste is static and it is discriminative and it needs to be uh, like diluted but when you see the fluid or dynamic motions so today in case of intermarriage that is inter caste marriages caste is getting fluid and even if you see in case of cities today because of urbanization and globalization people are not urbanization and globalization today people are working in different arenas not on the basis of their caste they decide their occupation they decide their occupation based on merit that opportunity has been given because of globalization and urbanization so you can talk about that and you can also talk about political uh, that is empowerment that is standing in elections so this is some area where scst and reserved communities find an opportunity to stand in elections and they, once they get elected they have the chance to get empowered and empower their society also with the powers so these are the areas uh, they feel that still caste system is fluid or dynamic but there are areas still where caste system is rigid and it is still practiced in the society with respect to these functions so this should be presented in your answer along with examples from various societies of india or from various regions of india if you do that then you are going to answer the question completely now moving into the final question so this question is about discuss the impact of post liberal economy on the ethnic identity and communalism if you read the question you could understand very clearly the question is bothered about only on two components that is ethnic identity and on communalism and again since they have asked directive discuss introduction body conclusion in the structure of the answer before conclusion try to write way forward so this should never be missed in discussion based questions and when you talk about the impact so impact you, you always have the liberty to write positive impact as well as the negative impact that is one dimension you can add in this question second coming to the uh, main crux of the question the subtopic for the question can be classified into two categories one is post liberal impact of post liberal economy impact of post liberal economy on ethnic identity so this is the first part of the question and if you go to this second half of the question they are asking about the impact of post liberal economy on communalism the impact of post liberal economy on communalism friends for this type of question whenever you write answer make sure that you always have a valid examples uh, in your answer to justify what you want to say for example here they are actually asking what is the impact of that is globalization post liberal economy is after 1991 on ethnic identity you know what is the meaning of ethnicity ethnicity is the one the person they are uh, groups of persons are actually discriminated or divided on the basis of ethnicity when they have similarity in their geographical region similarity in their cultural values and similarity in their uh, like uh, other anthropological parameters so based on these areas we classify a particular identity as ethnic identity and what is the problem after uh, 1991 liberalization privatization and globalization so what impact it had on ethnic identity so basically if you see the major impact was along the that is cultural ethnic or cultural uh, ethnic homogeneity homogeneity so what is the meaning is 
after the liberalization privatization globalization people in india they had actually the main advantage in india is unity in diversity so people of northeastern india they have more ethnic they are they have more ethnic identity but what is the problem is after 1991 most of these ethnic identities were lost either because these people were forced to live from their forest and mingle with the normal people or because these people are actually forced to work as wage laborers or due to other reasons they have been shifted out of the forest areas so because of that what has happened the heterogeneity among these ethnic people have been diminished and there is a more homogeneity which is prevailing today so that is one negative impact you can also talk about the concept of cultural assimilation so what is the meaning of cultural assimilation is the dominant community for example <clears throat> the dominant religion in india is hinduism so now what it will do is those tribals who are coming out from this northeastern regions if they have some similarities with hinduism then hinduism will try to identify those religions under its category under the notion of hinduism these people will also belong to if they identify if they try to do this reclassification then it is called as cultural assimilation that means a dominant community or a dominant religion or caste will try to subsume or subjugate the minor community or religion under its category so due to this process the cultural identity of these ethnic people that is the northeastern tribal peoples will be completely lost so these are two big negative impact we have uh, because of the liberalized economy on ethnic identity so we should talk about this then coming to the impact of post liberal economy on communalism so communalism we know on the basis of religion Uh, these people believe that one religion exists in opposite to another religion so that these two religions cannot live in harmony and they have to fight together those are the peoples who believe in communalism so communalism means hindu and muslim people they fight together also example for communalism and after the impact of post liberal economy there is an increase in communal tensions in india there is an increase in communal tensions in india so you can quote the various babar masjid issue and other issues which has happened in india after 1991 where because of all this communal tensions happened and where the religious harmony of the people has been disturbed so because of that people fight against each other so you can try to include always but make sure that you always come come with various examples in your answer